So as we had talked about earlier, the manifestations of cardiac sarcoidosis may be vague and may involve almost any element of the heart. Dr. Blau, I talked about the heart failure elements when the heart function is reduced. But as I alluded to earlier, we also worry about electrical elements, electrical abnormalities. In many patients who have cardiac sarcoidosis, one of the first presentations might be a rhythm called complete heart block or heart block in general. This finding is one in which the upper and lower chambers of the heart or atria and ventricles, which are supposed to talk to one another sequentially, stop talking to one another in a one-to-one -one fashion. A lot of times this can just occur with normal aging or because of any multitude of other factors. But cardiac sarcoidosis is one of those things that can cause this. Many patients, when they see this lack of communication between the upper and bottom chambers of the heart, might receive a pacemaker in order to put the two sides back in sync. However, one of the key things we worry about in cardiac sarcoidosis is not just the slow rhythms, but the dangerous fast rhythms. Those that can cause a patient to suddenly pass out or in some cases, suddenly die. And the problem is, we do not want to wait for the first episode to happen, because the first episode could be the last. Because of that, we talked earlier about the importance of getting tests, such as ECGs, Holter monitors, which might show us some evidence of these abnormal rhythms, but in many cases, electrophysiology studies. In electrophysiology studies, as I talked about earlier, we will try to stimulate the heart out of rhythm. And if we find, based on specific criteria, that we can fairly easily stimulate the heart out of rhythm, we might identify a patient who merits an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. Now, pretty much all cardiac defibrillators can potentially act as pacemakers. But a pacemaker is not necessarily a defibrillator. They serve very different functions. So an ICD kind of covers both sides of the coin. There's a lot of study going on in terms of who would benefit most from defibrillators in cardiac sarcoidosis. Our early guidelines suggested that just having a diagnosis was enough. More recent guidelines suggest that we look at results of an electrophysiology study whether there's enough involvement of the heart to cause the heart function to go lower. Looking at ele elements of scar on the MRI that might suggest what we call substrate or areas of short circuit that might cause the abnormal rhythms. Because we're doing this in many cases for primary prevention. While we hope you never have an episode, the device never has to go off, you never have an abnormal rhythm. We're trying to prevent you from potentially dying from the first one. Now, if a patient is having abnormal rhythms, any particular type of abnormal rhythm, less dangerous rhythms such as atrial fibrillation or PVCs or premature ventricular contractions, um, which are early extra beats of the bottom chamber of the heart, which might be symptomatic, or in more severe cases, actual ventricular arrhythmias where the bottom chamber is just going off to the races on its own, potentially causing somebody to repeatedly pass out, or the defibrillator to have to shock them. Then we start talking about how can we stop these abnormal rhythms from happening. And there are two avenues to that. One is using medications, such as antiarrhythmic drugs. And the decision making on specific antiarrhythmic drugs is complex and requires close discussion with an individual with expertise in this area. And in some cases, we may even go on to ablation which is a more invasive procedure where we go in to identify the areas of short circuit and try to intervene upon them by essentially burning or causing alteration in those cells to prevent them from acting up. And depending on the rhythm, depending on the situation, the likelihood of success might be highly variable and thus going to a center which has high volume an individual with expertise in the specific type of ablation you might need is so critical. And really this delves into prognosis. The issue is that 
we don't want to see you progress. We don't want to see the patient with cardiac sarcoidosis to get worse. We want to arrest or stop the progression of it when we first see them. And part of this is avoiding the potential ways it can cause complications. In the most severe manifestations, that would be death. But in other manifestations, it might be heart failure worsening and getting to a point where we start talking about transplants, which Dr. Blauet will talk about in a little bit. But we also want to make sure that these rhythm abnormalities don't happen, that we have the right safety nets, the right things in place to avoid the worst possible situations that might happen from cardiac sarcoidosis. The prognosis in cardiac sarcoidosis, unfortunately, is not overall very well established. In some patients, it can rapidly progress, and other patients can have an incident episode of it and do fairly well. That's why here, we are so focused on doing studies and trying to engage in collaborative discussions and potentially trials into how to best arrest the course of this disease and avoid these worst possible outcomes and decide when certain interventions are needed, which might be different from other types of heart disease.